situation. Hawaii was moving quickly back to normal the day after the ferocious attack by monster Hurricane Eva, but we have a long way to go. Eva has left a legacy of destruction and tragedy. Three storm-related deaths, damage to property in the millions, planes and boats tossed like twigs, trees and poles snapped like toothpicks, and electricity, of course, became a precious commodity. We begin with a series of reports. First, Russell Shimoka, who has been on Kauai for the past 24 hours. At about 1 o'clock Tuesday afternoon, the winds and sea had already picked up speed. And it was then and there the people of Kauai knew they were going to be in for a rough night. The seas were expected to rise 20 to 30 feet, winds anywhere from 80 to 130 miles an hour. Hurricane Evie was predicted to smash the south side of the island, and here at Poipu Beach, that prediction was seemingly becoming true. What was happening at Poipu was indicative of what was taking place all over the island. Waves already came pouring over the break wall, causing extensive flooding to homes on the shoreline. When the order came down, an immediate evacuation began. Our police department, all beach residents are urged to leave the area. Police and civil defense workers swiftly moved residents from the low-line areas. Some made sure the hatches were battened down before leaving. Those evacuated from the Poipu area were taken to Koloa Community School, one of several shelters set up by the Red Cross. This was to be their home for the night, or the next couple of nights, for no one really knew how long the storm would last. Number 2453213 for information on where to go uh, for evacuation, etc. The civil defense is very, working very hard right now, and uh, not to be called unless it is a dire emergency. A few tuned in to portable radios for the latest information, while others became preoccupied with something else. Of course, there were some of those who just didn't know what was going on. Meantime, in Lehui, schools and county offices were closed early, enabling residents to prepare their homes for the high winds. Stores took the warning seriously, taping up windows and reinforcing doors. The pounding winds took their toll early. A broken sign here, torn off roofing there, but nothing like the destruction soon to come. Lehui thus became a ghost town. No one in sight for blocks. At 2.30, the Luhui Airport was closed down, marooning travelers on an island destined for a beating. There will be no more flights today. We are going to be closing the terminal building. We will ask you to depart the terminal building on the Gray Line buses arriving at the front of the terminal. They 4 p.m., EV really began to brew, tossing the ships in Nawiliwili Harbor like toy boats in a bathtub. At this time, the streets were not safe. Trees and power lines gave way to the powerful force of Hurricane Evie. The brunt of the storm hit the island at 7 p.m. Strong, sturdy palm trees were no match for the relentless winds topping off at 110 miles an hour. Windows at the Kauai Surf Hotel simply gave way, scattering debris all over the place. This lobby was just recently renovated, and now it's a total mess. But while the storm raged outside, inside people tried to stay calm. But somehow, there's always a connection between storms and spirits. And if you ask this crowd, the response might have been, what storm? But later on today, we see the aftermath of Poipu Beach. What was once a beautiful resort area now looked like a battlefield. Cars, many of them damaged and overturned. The place was littered with cars from this, well, this carpool to those that didn't have it so easy. Condominiums were completely destroyed. Also, the beach didn't have much to do anyway. Road, cars wouldn't have been uh, much luck anyway because the roads were so much damaged. Trees also fell. They also fell on houses. They uprooted this big tree. And also, power lines were completely destroyed. We'll have more later on tonight. This is Russell Shimoka reporting from Kauai. And we also sent another news center for a crew to Kauai today to follow up on the aftermath of Eva and the cleanup. Here's that report. This is Kelly Dean. In quite a contrast from yesterday, the sun was out on Kauai today. It could be seen reflecting off the copper roof of Lihui's first Hawaiian bank. The only problem, the bank's roof was in the street. The Lihui business district was like a morgue today. There was no electricity, water, and in most cases, telephone service available. So the stores just stayed closed. The only activity in town, the cleanup. 
You got any damage down it? What in the front plate glass, what in the plate glass? Correct. You boarded it up? I boarded it up with a uh, five bar. Okay. It's okay. Good, fine. National Guard troops were called in to secure all the damaged financial institutions. There were reports of looting at several businesses and homes during the confusion that followed the hurricane's onslaught last night. Governor Ariyoshi flew to Kauai this morning for a first-hand look at the destruction. The damages that I've seen just coming from the airport to here is very extensive, and I'm really shocked at the extent of the damages. Uh, all of the trees, uh, uh, the roof, uh, the buildings are uh, uh, being damaged. Uh, it's a horrible sight. After I came here, I met General Ishimoto, and he has already instructed the people here to make a list of the kind of things that they need in a hurry. The pumps, the generating equipment, the electrical generating equipment. We can put them in where the need is the greatest now. We've also indicated that we're going to go to the Navy, the Marines, the Army uh, in Honolulu, ask them to, uh, about the facilities that they have, and whatever they have, we can borrow them so that we can get things back to operational level as soon as possible here. The governor called the devastation the worst Hawaii disaster he's ever seen. Everywhere you looked on Kauai today, the streets were littered with debris, including power poles that snapped like twigs from the force of the hurricane winds. Those same winds also reduced the state's oldest Lutheran church to kindling. It had been standing for more than 100 years when it crumbled in the face of yesterday's storm. The nearly total destruction came just one month after the completion of a five-year restoration project on the church. I we were just thinking about sitting back and taking it easy, because I'm only, I will be 88 in January, and uh, perhaps this is the Lord saying, look, you got some more useful years, you got a job ahead if you start in restoring it. Spire estimates it will cost up to a half a million dollars to once again restore his church. Just down the street from the church, the Ho'omana Ho'ohana Athletic Club's tennis courts were wiped out. The facility's clubhouse was also blown over. Dozens of homes were demolished by the hurricane. In some cases, the damage was so complete, it almost looked as if a giant hand had reached out and ripped the house apart. Well, as you can see from the, uh, ways, the way the trees are set, uh, there's a lot of wind coming out of the valley from both directions. Uh, really started hard about uh, 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Uh, the neighbor's house here gave way about 4.30, and they stayed with me uh, through the storm, and uh, mostly from the wind, not too much rain, just, uh, just wind. Trees were uprooted all across Kauai. Others were cut down intentionally to prevent them from accidentally falling over. The damage in some housing areas was widespread, and as with downtown Lehui, the cleanup is underway. Making me so scared, I don't know what to say. Everything, you know, shaking, and I look at outside, everything was crying, yeah. <laughs> Roofing line, everything, yeah. Several air raid sirens were blown off their mounts by the storm, and radio station KIVM had its tower knocked over, although it managed to stay on the air by stringing a ground antenna. The airport was another area hard hit by the storm. Several planes were severely damaged, including this crop duster that was flipped over by the strong winds. Service in and out of the Hui Airport resumed this morning. Some of the first to arrive, the Red Cross. After we've made our initial assessment, and be determined uh, how many additional personnel we'll have to send over from Oahu and uh, even perhaps from the continental United States. Helix predicts that Red Cross personnel will be on Kauai for as long as a month, cleaning up after the hurricane. The airport was jammed with tourists today who were trying to get off the island since it had no water, power, or hot meals available. But trying to handle the passenger load without telephones, electricity, and computerized reservations was no easy chore. Everybody wants to go at the same time. They all want to check in at the same time. The airlines added extra flights to handle the Kauai backlog, but even so, most passengers had to wait several hours to catch a plane. What everyone here on Kauai is thankful for is that no one was killed by the hurricane. There were numerous injuries, however, but luckily most of those were just minor cuts and lacerations caused by shattering glass and flying debris. Kelly Dean, New Center 4, on Kauai. Now on Oahu, one of the areas hardest hit last night, the Leeward Coast, from Nanakuli to Makaha. Many homes there met the ocean's wrath and lost. Here's a look at some of the damage from the Leeward Coast. 
This is Ann Botticelli. If one area on the Leeward Coast had to be declared the hardest hit, it might be this Macau Street neighborhood in Makaha. Here, houses were totally reduced to rubble or split into several pieces and distributed at the whim of the sea throughout the area. Until last night, two houses stood side by side right here. Now they're across the street. Underneath this pond-like area, Macau Street continues. Yet this morning, homeowners who gathered to figure out where everything was remained calm. Their neighborhood was destroyed, but they were not. The house is material, and the family means more than the material thing that we have. So we're thankful for that. Residents here and in other homes along the Farrington Highway coast were among 1,000 evacuated last night to friends' homes or emergency shelters. Most say they left their homes around 6 p.m. Overnight, wind sand and waves crashing over the sand dunes on the Mackay side of the highway. Inside the shelters, residents did what they could to divert their thoughts, no doubt wondering what they would find when they returned home. For Hiro and Bessie Takahashi, it was much worse than expected. Although water was crashing onto their lawn when they left home yesterday evening, Mrs. Takahashi said she expected only some flooding. What she found instead left her speechless, and Mr. Takahashi was surprised as well. We lived here 25 years, and uh, we lived through all the tidal waves and whatnot, and it's the first time something like this ever happened to us. Along the highway this morning, people were either cleaning up their own property or helping someone else clean up his. Ed DeMello, who became one of the few Leeward Coast residents to suffer injuries when a piece of his roof blew off onto his feet, supervised friends trying to bolster the foundation of his home. DeMello is sitting in what used to be an enclosed storage area. Even further down the road in Nanakuli, residents recounted the horrors of the night before. The first wave came moving the embankment, and when I was talking to my supervisor, and I seen the wave coming, and the next thing you knew, the tower pools fell down. So I told my workers to, let's get out of here. This came over the bank. This just started to come in, come in, and keep going further inside, you know? Surveying the damage along the highway, the obvious question is, where do they go from here? The answer, however, isn't that simple. What are you going to do next? I don't know. Ann Botticelli, News Center 4. I'm Sandy Carney. Hurricane force winds and waves pounded ships and resulted in the so far only death attributed directly to the storm. The Navy reported that a crewman aboard the USS Goldsboro died as a result of injuries. Several other crewmen were injured as Navy ships were ordered from Pearl Harbor to weather the storm at sea. One man was reported swept overboard and later made it to shore. In Honolulu itself, most of the hurricane damage centered in the waterfront areas. Today, Honolulu Harbor itself is calm, but it was a different story last night at Kihei Lagoon. By 7.30 Tuesday night, boat owners at Kihei Lagoon were fighting 60-mile-an-hour winds to secure their vessels. Well, we're just trying to pull it off the pier a little bit to keep it off the windward side. Just, the, two, the two boats over here, the bow bubbles were just beating together and smashing each other up. And just everybody sort of gets together and helps whatever boats they can. You know, who's ever down here, take, take care of the people that's not. Several boat owners weren't as lucky. This vessel was completely destroyed, smashed to pieces against the pier. It was rougher than the very blazes. <laughs> well, we put tires all along the side of it and tried to uh, keep it from banging against the pier. And some big surges come through and a big wind gust toppled the top off of it and the tires all popped out and it just chewed it up on the pier. This one swamped and sank. Early Wednesday morning, owner B.J. Johnson saw his home and everything he owned under 15 feet of water. That's it. That's everything right there. We were so concerned about saving the boat, didn't worry about saving anything in the boat. Well, like even the clothes you have on are... Well, they, they're borrowed from friends, uh, other boats that had the same concern last night. It was quite a chaos. At Kihei, Rescue 2 was on duty throughout the night. For Oahu, the Fire Alarm Bureau reported 140 alarms in a 12-hour period. The usual number is 20. I've been in the fire department for 20 years, and this is the first time something of this magnitude. Most of those alarm calls were coming from three areas on Oahu, Waianae, Kailua, and one of the hardest hit, Kaneohe, with over 30 homes severely damaged and several, like this one on Kalali Street, completely destroyed. And the wind kept getting stronger and stronger, and I got real worried, and I got up and I walked in the kitchen. Just as I walked into the kitchen, the roof went. And by the time I broke the speed records, turned around getting on the floor behind the door, 
it was gone. It was probably one or two seconds, and the entire roof went at one time. It didn't go in pieces. What will you do from here? We're going to try and find a place to live and, and rebuild stronger. Winds early in the evening tore down Haiku Road, toppling high power lines, smashing cars and homes. Unlike Waianae residents who had been evacuated to shelters, Kaneohe residents had no official warning when the winds gusting up to 100 miles an hour hit. I, I was sleeping here, sound asleep. What happened? What did it sound like? The loudest thunder I ever heard in my life. What will you do now? What, what I'm going to do now? Mm -hmm. I don't know, my wife not home. Most of the injuries last night in Kaneohe were caused by broken glass, shattered and sent flying by the high winds. Castle Hospital reported over 50 treated in the emergency room. We've had uh, injuries such as um, glass breaking and hitting patients in the eyes. We had one lady where her house caved in and she was hit by plate glass and a brick wall. We had a man who was in his home and his ceiling fell in. He had a back injury with a laceration. And uh, most of it's been laceration. Today, Kaneohe residents begin digging out from under the debris. Marines at the Kaneohe base were called out, some assisted with keeping traffic moving through the stricken areas. Throughout the day, a mile-long line of trucks, commercial and private vehicles, were headed toward Kailua Dump, carrying fallen trees and the remnants of houses that had been smashed beyond repair. Yet to be estimated damages in the Kailua Kaneohe area include agriculture. Whole plantations of bananas were destroyed, like this one with a crop that was just about ready for harvest. Telephone and electric company crews have been working around the clock to try to restore power to the stricken areas. In the aftermath of the tragedy, there was an obvious air of relief and camaraderie among those cleaning up. Perhaps the memories of just getting through the night before had something to do with it. Even in Honolulu, for example, when for several hours the lights were out, the winds howled, signs were turned upside down on Nimitz Highway, and the solitary rescue and repair crews went about the business of trying to get things back to normal. Sandy Carney and cameraman Brian Smith for New Center 4. And late in the day, Governor Ariyoshi announced that he, of course, will be seeking federal disaster relief. He also said that he could see damaged houses and roofs below as he flew over Niihau today. There is no specific information on how Niihau fared. The eye of Eva passed right over it. Lynn? There was a fatal traffic accident this morning that claimed the lives of two people. The tragedy occurred at about 10.15 at the intersection of King Street and University Avenue when a private refuse collector and a white Datsun collided. Both the driver of the car and her passenger were taken to Queens Medical Center where they died later. Police said only tentative identifications have been made and that next of kin must still be located. The driver of the truck was apparently uninjured. According to police at the scene, the truck was on King Street traveling Cocoa head. The car also traveling on King Street but headed in the EVA direction. It was making a left turn onto University Avenue when the accident occurred. Police said there have been conflicting eyewitness reports as to whether or not the traffic signals were operating at the time. Today's deaths mark the 87th and 88th fatalities on Oahu for the year as compared to 85 at the same time last year. Extensive damage was done to some old wooden homes at the Diamond Head end of Waikiki. Michelle Lum and cameraman Doug Haya were at the site this morning to view the aftermath. There used to be a brick seawall here. It acted as a barrier and protected these old but charming wooden homes from the wave action. Last night, the seawall might just as well have been made out of paper. There are six houses on this piece of property, which is owned by Hazel International, a Japanese conglomerate. Steve Vallow manages the units. He also lives here. And last night, he and the tenants from next door were having dinner when the first of a series of waves struck. About 8 o'clock last night, the first wave came in. It was about 25 feet high. It came over both the stories in the house. We were eating in the living room to our right right here, uh, in the upper living room. Luckily, the blinds were pulled down, the glass came in, the walls came in, the furniture started going out in the ocean, and we just had enough time to grab our wallets, grab a couple pieces of clothes, and go out the back door. Vallo said a couple of the ways completely engulfed the front homes. He said although basic precautions were taken, somehow you never realize how serious a hurricane can be until it actually strikes. Residents were cleaning up this morning, salvaging what they could, and for the most part, just worrying about today and letting tomorrow take care of itself. This is Michelle Lum for News Center 4. And News Center 4's Emmy Tamimbong has been surveying the damage at Honolulu International Airport. And 
damage to at least a half dozen small planes. Here's her report now. It's business as usual here at the Honolulu International Airport, where it has been for the most part through last night's storm. But it's cleanup time this morning here at Gate 18. Maintenance crews this morning were sweeping up bits and pieces of glass, which shattered just the night before. It happened while some 400 outbound passengers were about to board an American Airlines flight to Texas. The force of the 90 mile per hour winds blew out an entire panel, sending glass upward, ripping through the ceiling. Upon their departure this morning, Morning, the passengers who got an extra day in Hawaii were in relatively good spirits despite last night's incident. And all of a sudden the one window blew in. There was a, a, a lot of screaming, no panic really. Quite a few uh, women were hurt. It was mass panic. Uh, people were running, people were yelling, get down, get down, and the glass was just flowing through the window. It was uh, totally, uh, it was bizarre. It was like a scene from a movie. At least three passengers were treated and released for superficial cuts and wounds in the incident. In other airport damages, the control tower last night would have probably been surprised at seeing some strange planes on the runway, unpiloted. At least four planes danced around and moved about the airport runways last night, some for even half a mile. One DC-3 did just that after being towed and tied down twice. And here at the old Lockheed building, we find a Cessna 150 completely flipped over on its back, having made a somersault over that fence. Looked like about six or eight airplanes suffered major damage up to including total loss. A lot of minor damage, rudders and control surfaces damaged. Aircraft hit by debris flying through the air. At the National Weather Service, the crew, some having been up all night, were now a bit relieved that the worst was over. Weather forecasters this morning charted Hurricane Eva at least 350 miles east of Honolulu, now downgraded into a tropical storm and quickly dissipating out into the open seas. But last night, at the peak of her winds, the National Weather Service was without any satellite or teletype communications, making it difficult to track Eva and inform the public of her force and direction. This uh, experience makes you think or bring up the whole situation that uh, without any kind of backup power we're virtually helpless in this kind of emergency? Well that, that's always a consideration and that's something that uh, we have certainly been aware of for a long long time and uh, these are things that uh, we're looking into and we, we understand the vulnerability of the power and the communications problem that's true. Last night's storm could have been worse. And though we may be spending time now evaluating our preparedness, the good news once again is the weather. It looks like most of the bad weather is now out of the way, and for the next few days it looks like we're going to have the regular balmy weather that we normally have in Honolulu. Happy Thanksgiving. You're right. Thanksgiving should be a good one. Emmy Timembang, News Center 4 at the National Weather Service. Ken Anderson spent most of yesterday and last night at the Oahu Civil Defense Headquarters monitoring what information was available. And she's with us live in the studio tonight. Mayor Anderson, have you had a chance to look around the island today? Yes, Lynn, we did make a complete tour of Oahu today uh, to get some first-hand view of what the situation was. Obviously, as your pictures have already shown, the worst damage was in the Waianae Nanakuli area. Uh, we have extensive work to do out there. We did then go on over Kunia Road and into Wahiawa in the Schofield Barracks area, and I was amazed at the heavy damage at Schofield Barracks. They've suffered uh, tremendous damage to homes, to the trees, to new structures in that area. The Wahiawa town uh, has severe damage. The roofs are off. Uh, there's uh, glass and debris all over the streets. We went on around then, and uh, I think one thing that impressed me most is we went on around near our Laiea Corporation yard, uh, there's a, a stretch of about a mile with every single telephone pole just lying flat on the ground. Then as you get into Kahalu, Kaava, Kahalu, and the Kaneohere area again, you see severe damage to the homes, to garages, to uh, uh, private property all in that area. So uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of heavy damage uh, throughout the island. I realize this would be a preliminary assessment, but do you have any kind of monetary damage estimates yet? Yes, we do. Our, our departments were um, getting their data back to Civil Defense Agency. It, it is very early, uh, but a rough estimate at this stage is uh, about $40 million, $10 million of which would be to federal property, uh, $30 million to private, of which uh, private and our own public. 
uh, about four million dollars to public facilities. Uh, that's, uh, that's our best guess at this time. There is some state aid available, although it's just over a million dollars and a drop in a bucket, so to speak, in uh, situations like this. But is there any aid on the city and county level that's comparable to that? Well, we do have aid for uh, individuals, uh, those who have suffered damage to their homes. Uh, we do have a program for providing low interest uh, loans uh, for rehabilitation. And our people at the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development will be circulating that information as soon as we can. They, the Red Cross is working and they all know about that sort of aid. We will be asking the governor to declare Oahu uh, an emergency uh, so that we can qualify for some of that state aid and also to help him in making a, uh, an appeal to the federal government for aid. Let me just ask quickly because there has already been a great deal of discussion about it last night and today about the, uh, the communications gap that took place last night. Now, what is your assessment of the civil defense operation and the communication situation, and do you feel it needs some reevaluation, reassessment, and possible revision? Tim, it certainly does. Uh, I spent many hours in the uh, civil defense uh, center last night and saw firsthand what had happened there. I was very concerned about the fact that the people in our community went through a blackout, in effect, of getting good information as to what was, what was going on. Uh, we certainly have to evaluate that and, and make sure that doesn't happen again. I also was concerned about the fact that in no one place on the island of Oahu could you get a feed-in of information from all sources. For example, right next to our Civil Defense Agency is the Fire Alarm Bureau, and I spent much time in there listening and, and seeing what was going on, but that meant that we didn't know what was going on in the police side. So depending on where you were, you got a certain segment of the information. And it seems to me that we ought to have some central place where, where the press could come, for example, and know that what they were getting represented the full range of information feeding into a central center uh, about the situation out in the community. So we're certainly going to reassess that. Good. We're still having a lot of power problems all over the island in several areas. Is there anything you'd like to, to say to the people of Oahu? Lynn, I think I have to be... Uh, say to everyone that they must be very, very conservative about the use of any kind of power. You know, uh, today was such a delightful day in Honolulu. It was so sunny and people were back out of the beach and it was sort of as though nothing had happened. If your power was on, you felt as though nothing had occurred. But I must say to all of you that we're in a very serious situation throughout the island. With the electric power off, it means that we're having trouble pumping water. It means that we're having trouble pumping our sewer system. Uh, we're having trouble keeping the uh, street lights going, the traffic signals going. Everything on this island is terribly dependent upon that electricity. And of course, I know the gas company's having trouble because they don't have electricity. And so my appeal to everybody in the community tonight is, please do not use any more water than you need to. Do not use any more electricity than you need to. If you don't have to go out this evening, don't go out because uh, the traffic lights are sometimes on, sometimes they're not on. Uh, it is a critical situation, I believe. And while we have everybody working very hard at it, it's going to take time. And so, uh, you know, tomorrow's Thanksgiving. We have a lot to be thankful for today, that we are all here and, uh, and we came through it quite well. Uh, but I think we have to be very, very, very cautious tomorrow uh, and perhaps uh, show our, our thanks in some way other than, than spending several hours cooking. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor Anderson, for coming down to share that with us tonight. The Red Cross and the Civil Defense have their first semi-complete damage assessment. Teams began working early this morning and from aerial and land reconnaissance have come up with a rough estimate of damage to Ni'ihau, Kauai, and Oahu. They put structural damage in three categories. Destroyed, meaning it would not be financially feasible to repair the building. Major, the home is unlivable at present, but it is repairable. And minor, repairs are needed, but the home can be lived in for the time being. Along the leeward coast, preliminary estimates, again these are preliminary, show 26 homes destroyed, 117 with major damage and 137 with minor damage. On Ni'ihau, about 20 damaged homes, no other information as to degree of damage or personal injuries. And on Kauai, again a very rough estimate of 5,000 homes destroyed or sustaining major damage. One note of good news, however, the Nanakuli and Wahiwa shelters will be serving dinner tonight between 6 and 8.30, and people in those areas with no power are welcome. Tim? 
In times of crisis, mariners usually look to the Coast Guard for assistance, but the Coast Guard had some problems of its own with Hurricane Eva. On Kauai, a 40-foot Coast Guard patrol boat sank after being smashed by surf as high as 12 feet and, of course, the 100-mile-per-hour winds. The boat was still tied up at the pier in the Wheelie Wheelie Harbor. When it went down, six other boats in the harbor sank or ran aground. Now on Maui, a Coast Guard boat capsized in Ma'alaya Harbor after being buffeted by the high surf. A 21-foot Boston whaler was en route to assist another boat when it capsized. The crew swam ashore. There were no injuries. And today, Coast Guard spokesmen said that both vessels could be salvaged. And on Oahu, another patrol boat ran aground near the Sand Island drawbridge. A 40-foot ship was pulled free by another Coast Guard vessel. And last night, hundreds of volunteers turned out to help save the Falls of Clyde. The museum ship was pounded by high surf and winds until it began breaking its lines. Volunteers strained to, con to control the ship, which was in danger of breaking up. Finally, two barges were used to remove the ship to the relative safety of Pier 35. While the Falls of Clyde suffered only minor damage, the pier, where it was initially tied up, was severely damaged. And right next door, the Oceania floating restaurant ship was having problems of its own. The high winds and seas smashed into the boat, the pier, workers fought to save it. Most of the ship's 26 mooring lines were snapped, and all three gang planks were torn away. Other than some minor damage to the exterior and a chandelier that crashed to the showroom floor, the Oceania escaped serious damage. A spokeswoman said they hope to restore the utilities and be back in business on Monday. Although the boats and the sailors didn't weather the storm too well, tourists today seemed rather unaffected, as Michelle Lum found out after a stroll through Waikiki. Driving through Waikiki the day after a hurricane brought a few surprises. We mainly met up with down palm fronds and a sand-covered road which looked like an extension of Kuhio Beach. As for our visitors, most of them seemed to take the storm all in stride. Oh yeah, it was going on and off all over the area and we just kind of stood out on the balcony and watched it go on and off. It was uh, kind of like a show. We're at the Pacific Beach Hotel and uh, my, my mom climbed up 29 flights of stairs. It was long, but uh, they were very good. You know, we stopped every two floors or so. They just said, whenever you feel like it, just stop. And everybody really pulled together. We made so many friends last night. We had a what, cold, uh, cold sandwiches for meal. Trying to get a cup of coffee in the first morning since yesterday at lunchtime. That's how our visitors fared. Many looking to buy their first hot meal since early yesterday afternoon, then spend the rest of the day sunning on the beaches. As for our residents, a number spent the day cleaning up. Electricity was or still is out throughout Oahu, and food spoilage is a very real problem. Ruth Spargo of Hawaiian Electric Company had some tips on refrigeration. If the food is still in the freezer, uh, it may be okay, depending on the type of freezer you have. If uh, you have a top mount freezer, the food could last up to 24 hours. A side-by-side, -side, 12 to 18 hours, a separate freezer, uh, either a chest type or upright, up to 72 hours. So usually uh, the best thing is to do is not open the door until that time has elapsed. Fargo says there are all kinds of variables affecting the quality of your food. Size of refrigerator, how filled it was, how cold it was. Unfortunately, there are no general rules to follow. The best measuring stick is, if in doubt, toss it out. Spargo says their crews are working to get full service restored, and for now they're asking the public to please limit the use of electricity. She also suggests that you turn off the circuit breaker to your water heater, the household's major consumer of electricity. This is Michelle Love for News Center 4. In the wake of Eva, three Oahu utility companies today were desperately trying to correct the devastation the storm produced. Representatives from Hawaiian Telephone, Gasco, and Hawaiian Electric each tried to outline their plan of action and clear up a confused picture. But our biggest problem is the traffic on the network because most of our switching centers are on standby power. That's either on a generator or batteries. And those facilities can be worn down by the amount of calling each switching center has to handle. And if we have high traffic loads, we're not going to be able to carry the load for much longer. And we may see offices start to drop off as the batteries fail or as the generators uh, get overloaded and uh, fuses start to blow. So I have to urge everybody to please be careful about what types of calls they make. 
We're asking Oahu residents uh, who use utility gas, and that's primarily in the area from Waipau to uh, Hawaii Kai, that uh, they uh, minimize the use of the gas if there's some necessity for having it, and hopefully uh, that they've turned down their uh, water heaters to the pilot level, and that's just a little valve and it says pilot on it or on, and you can just turn it right to the pilot level, or in addition to that, uh, to uh, uh, keep the burners off on their uh, stoves and don't do any clothes drying and things of that nature. All the way up the windward side of the island to Kahuku, back down the north shore to Waialua, from Waialua to Wahiawa is out of service and will remain out of service for some uh, day or days to come. We don't have the capacity to provide the service to everyone. So we're in effect taking turns and we are going to attempt to try to keep you on as long as we can and only take outages when we have to but we're trying at the same time to give everybody their turn. As the evening comes on and as the load picks up, as people turn lights on and start to cook and use their water heaters, I'm afraid that these rolling blackouts are going to get more frequent and the time intervals are going to get shorter. And the Board of Water Supply has issued an urgent advisory here on Oahu urging that you use water only for drinking and cooking. The reason, the water pumping system is dependent on electricity and it's experiencing the same outages as everyone else. This should last for just a few days. Hurricane Eva certainly dished up enough for emergency personnel to handle last night and today, but storm fighters and even the public have had more problems with which to deal because of the technical problems. Chris Casey has a report. Defense 6 from Civil Defense, over. Uh, negative, could you repeat it, please? They need cut and they need some fun. Hey, Roger, I will relay that information to the uh, Red Cross. This was the nerve center last night in Oahu, the Civil Defense Command post from which a wide range of emergency government and volunteer personnel received or relayed information in a desperate effort to provide for human safety. Emergency services of the city and county, the fire department, the police department uh, do their normal things and they accept that they do more of those things during a disaster such as this. We kept one watch back and we called another watch early, so we had an overlapping of watches. We also took our specialized units and put them in blue and white cars and sent them to Area 2, our rural area where most of the problems were existing. Uh, for instance, the solo bike officers were out there. The vice officers and detectives were in blue and white cars out in the area. They work with us. They have representatives in here and coordinate with us and respond to our requirements along with other agencies such as public works, state highways with their road crews, and that sort of thing. But the system was not perfect. There were problems in the operations. Primarily, emergency personnel seemed to agree in the transmission of information. For the fire department, our problem on the windward side in particular was uh, the breakdown in communications. We lost one of our uh, transmitter stations on the, on the call out for about an hour, and it, uh, it, it hampered our operations a little bit. And this is a very real problem, of course, and we just got a good taste of it last night. Uh, and, and it could be much worse if we had the, the full impact of a hurricane. We had been very concerned that the, we would get the uh, force of, uh, of the hurricane on the Waianae coast and the south shore. And we were very, very close to, uh, to having to evacuate people in those areas. We have been prepared. If that well, we were necessary. prepared to do it, however, but we would have had uh, monumental problems. We're talking about 30-some thousand people in the Waianae area that, um, that might, have had, might have required evacuation. The news media made every attempt to keep the public informed. News Center 4 extended their 9.30 newscast, normally a half hour, to two and a half hours. But for those homes without electricity to see the storm on TV, radio was their only link with the outside world. The flow of information to those public information outlets, however, was sparse. Lack of information, we had some. We didn't really hear a lot from the police department locally. We had to make calls to the police department, but I'm sure they had their hands full. Uh, the civil defense worked fairly well. It could have been better. Uh, we got reports about once every two hours. I was a little surprised about that. I think it should come in a little more rapidly than it did. 
Civil defense officials moved from the response to the damage assessment stage of their operation today, gradually closing down the evacuation shelters set up by the Red Cross, which housed some 1,000 evacuees overnight on Oahu. Civil defense officials say disaster assistance centers will be set up within the next few days to offer information on possible assistance island residents can receive. Island mayors Eileen Anderson and Eduardo Malapit will have to declare their counties to be in a disaster state to open the door for a declaration by Governor Ariyoshi of a statewide disaster that will possibly lead to assistance from the White House. Officials say announcements will be made later this week about exactly where and when the assistance centers will be set up. Chris Casey, News Center 4. Now, due to the extra time we've devoted to storm coverage, we will not be able to have tonight's installment of Larry Price's in-depth series called Guaranteed. Part three of that series will air tomorrow evening, part four on Friday, and the series will conclude with the fifth installment on Monday. Jim, tip-off is at 8 o'clock. And uh, tonight's volleyball game between the UH and Pacific has been postponed until 7.30 Friday night. That'll be at Clem Gym. Tim? Lynn. Lynn. Lynn? And I bet you can't guess what we're going to have next. More weather. A weather report, I but it's a wait. good one, so it's okay. We do want to tell you that high wind warnings remain in effect uh, for Haleakala on Maui and Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea on the Big Island. And high surf advisories are in effect still for the north and west shores of all Hawaiian islands. But it should be mostly fair and sunny across the state tomorrow, a high near 80, and winds will be 15 to 25 miles per hour. Airport Dotson is right on the price, right on the corner, and right on the interest. Looking for a truck? Look to Airport Dotson for 9.9 .9 financing. That's right, only 9.9% financing on all Dotson trucks. But there's more. Right now, you can buy any new Dotson from Airport Dotson and pay only 13%. That's quite an advantage. 13% financing on any new Dotson, including the brand new 83 Pulsar NX. We're Airport Dotson. Right on the price and right on the corner, 545 Lagoon Drive at YY Loop. Oh, I slept so good last night, and it's been that way ever since I got my new waterbed from Liquid Assets Water Bedrooms. Why would you believe I got all this for only $4.99? All our beds and accessories are made of solid woods, and yet the prices are unbelievably low. And for that sleek new look, there's the America the Elegant line with built-in stereo, all at Liquid Assets Water Bedrooms. Okay, Teddy, I think we can get in five more minutes. Come see how to get a free Betty Bear. Liquid Assets, 7-Eleven Keiomoku. In an age when accepting less for more is the standard fare at most restaurants, there is still one where you can dine quietly without compromise. The Summit, an award-winning restaurant dedicated to perfection in creating and serving extraordinary meals. Brunch, lunch, or dinner. When you want the best, Kulia Ikanu'u, strive for the Summit. High atop the Alamoana Hotel, Dining and dancing at its peak. This has been an expanded coverage tonight, as you probably have noticed, because we did have a great deal of video we wanted to show you of storm damage around the state, especially those graphic pictures from Kauai, which were absolutely outstanding. That gives you a, an idea of the devastation that was caused over there, especially, and of course on Oahu also. But thank you for being with us, and I'm glad we finally got a sports cast in, too. Right. right. You know, there's been so much activity going on, we've, we've forgotten to talk about Rick's picks. Oh. Can you believe that? What about Rick's picks? I can't <laughs> believe it. Rick's picks went 11-3, and three, something to brag about, finally. That's right. He finally gets a good week. and As soon as you get a good week, we got a hurricane. Right. <laughs> and the hurricane overshadows everything. I have to say, Rick really hung in there last night, though. He's he was sports director, but he was here till midnight. Helping working some news. Coordinating our news department. So. You were a great help. As them. was all our staff, as a matter of fact. I'm extremely impressed with the work that they did today. So thanks for joining us, and don't forget we'll have another newscast coming along just after 9.30 tonight, so I hope you'll be here for that. Thank you. Good evening. Good night.